Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, five weeks of games have come all down to this. Two more matches remain in the North American qualifiers for Challenger League season at number 11, and then we'll have our top 16 teams to go to close quals. This is going to be fans versus bread baggers. My name is Jesse J. Chick. I'm joined by Raven as my co-caster all the way from Australia, joining me once again. Thank you so much for joining me, Raven, and also Keglinik on The Observing. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Really excited to be back, and especially considering the stakes. Only two rounds to go, and there's quite a few teams still vying for spots. It's going to make a couple of these games really interesting. Yeah, so the way it works out right now, there are three spots up for grabs and five teams that still have a chance at making it. These two teams are both uh, in that pool of five. So a win for either squad is going to secure a top 16 spot. Mathematically, they'll be locked in for it. A loss is not for sure an elimination, but it's likely that they're not going to make it. It's going to depend on how the other games go. So uh, clearly a ton on the line, as you'd expect when we get down to these last couple of games. And folks, we're starting the match right now. It's going to be fans versus bread beggars on Villa. And I hope it's a good match. Yeah, and an interesting pick on Villa. We've seen, you know, some really strange matchups on Villa. We had a great one last week. It was Breadbaggers, in fact, against Grandpa Squad. And that was a really close affair going into OT. And we might see that again tonight, considering what's on the line for these teams. I have no doubt that they're going to be throwing their all into it, and it should be a really competitive match. So we'll get into the operator bans. Now Maverick going to be the first one off the board. Sorry for the delay, of course. So the teams took a little bit to uh, banning the maps, but thankfully we have started on time and we should be able to finish on time as well. Maverick gone, Havana gone as well. So it's going to be tough to uh, take down some of this hard destruction. Um, obviously that's two of your three hard structures off of the board. Typically I would say that like Thermite's uh, a little bit less useful on this one. Habana is generally uh, the more common operator. So this is, might be really hard for fans to uh, rack up early rounds. For sure. And the other thing about using Thermite on this map is due to just the vertical play that you can have as both an attacker and a defender, it's a bit of a trap as a Thermite walking up to some of those walls. The defenders could be holding different angles or set up different traps um just to take out that thermite could be a c4 uh even shotgunning out in front of a wall to prevent you from placing the charge on the floor can be a big issue so i think definitely for attack hard breach is going to play very little role to be honest i have seen like a couple of times in these qualifiers and also in pro league just recently like teams go for uh, all of their attacks on villa without a single hard breacher um team liquid brought it in uh, pro league a couple of uh, weeks ago and yeah, it's definitely an interesting strategy. I'm really excited to see if they can pull it off for fans because it's not an easy thing to uh, to pull off. Mm, yeah, it's not easy at all, but it's really interesting what it's forced some teams to do. And as you said, some Pro League teams have faced these situations in previous weeks. And what we're starting to see is a bit more of a coordinated frag-focused or really methodical push that comes out that just doesn't rely on those walls being open. And just having that shift seems to allow teams to be that extra thorough on attack and we're starting to see actually more attack rounds one from that which is quite surprising to me i feel like villa is like one of those maps that's sort of changing in the meta right like it definitely used to be one of the most defender side of the maps that we've ever had but uh you know continuing on like with this map's lifespan it's really become less and less uh, of a defender side of the map in my mind it still definitely leans there but uh, it's always an interesting match to see and if nothing else just to where those statistics are going to change to take a look at this operator lineup though that's a ton of aggression coming out from bread baggers right off the bat Yes, it is. And uh, look, I'm not too surprised that an Ella pick is there and that Ella will probably get picked a little bit more thanks to her Scorpion buff. Um, that first 16 bullets is pretty easy to control these days. And that's quite strong for an aggressive player on the room. Or you can even play her late round on site um, using her mines for plant denial or just slowing that entry. So she's quite strong again. Um, not too surprised about that. And we saw Breadbaggers utilizing the Alibi quite a lot last week. And it looks like they're sticking with that strategy so far. Which I think is quite fair. I mean, uh, if you like running the op, then hey. It can certainly uh, prove to be useful. I like the way they was using it last time, just on those like uh, windows positions in particular, um, defending on uh, maybe the secondary bomb site, right? So, tro uh, trophy statuary. So, uh, I'm interested to see what he does yeah. with it. Yeah, they use those to great effect to stall out pushing that side. Be interesting to see what they do this time. Looks like vertical play is going to be utilized here by fans, pushing that buck below into the library. Wolfie is pushing up these main stairs already. This is pretty good map control, nice and early, but he just shoots his teammate's drone, you know. 
just because he wanted to. <laughs> Why not, dude? I mean, get it out of here. Maybe it was a mozzie, but unfortunately, mozzie's not here, so you can't uh, you can't do that. I like the, the roam clear coming out from Wolsey's, right? Just based on the operator selection that was brought out from the defense, you know, he's going to be able to uh, take a look at some of these attackers and hopefully catch them off positions. They're not really playing downstairs, so it shouldn't be too uh, too detrimental unless they go for maybe a late game roam. But it can still certainly help out if you're unsure of where people might be down in sight, especially with Jolton down below. He's got a lot of opportunities perhaps to get some pings and then just you know, buck from down below. So, uh, you know, this is still not a terrible... Uh, use of utility they've wasted a lot of time but with how much they've uh you know gotten forward at least in terms of uh staying safe and opening things up i don't think it's bad but oh no i think that's an impact trick yeah it is yeah the impact trick both of those exothermic charges off so while it was great vertical play coming out of fans there they didn't really use it to the effect that they wanted those charges have been denied which means they're gonna have to start funneling through the hallway or through the study door which creates a very big choke point that the defense can easily control just past that two minute mark in the round and so the attacker is certainly going to start feeling that time pressure at some point here still worried about somebody down below that really hasn't been the play style to come up from bread baggers it's only been one round so it's tough to really know that if you're attacking but that is the situation that they currently face all of those aggressive operators maybe make it seems like they go for a roam but currently no player still inside a 90 this late is a huge problem as jolton is now finding out tito's just hasn't played aggressive at all that's totally the way to do it he'll get droned out now there's no more frag grenades for jolton so that's not going to work for him either wolsey's gets the opening pick guy on a bear answers right back on lsg so both canadians in the match already tito's taking a little bit of damage as it pushes aggressively inside a 90 15 seconds on that clock a lot of damage comes into wolsey's he goes down so does guy on the bear after just getting that kill bow and arrow takes him and there's bow and arrow actually going for the plant as well a three on three and giddy's trying to come in here and stop it he could have impacts but it's being watched and the teammates are there fans take it for round one a good execute from fans in the end i was a bit worried for them considering the amount of time that it just ticked away and just the denial that had come out from the defense but they just did that coordinated refragging to take sight and once they got through the plant cover was beautiful so i really like the end there from fans i think maybe what really went against bread baggers was they just didn't time their aggression that well and while they had control of the clock they ended up just letting fans take control of site. So we'll go for the rotation. Um, shout out to Talon, who is uh, very nice to provide all the casters with a bunch of map stats um, for this last week of qualifiers. This has been a very good map for both of the teams in the qualifiers so far. Fans have played it 70 or seven times. Breadbaggers have played Villa eight times, and both of them have over 85% win rates here. So, man, both these teams uh, have proved to be really strong on this map. And I think, you know, for a game as important as this one, your second last match uh, in the open qualifiers, for one of these teams, it'll be their last match. Uh, it's nice that we get to see it on a map that both teams are comfortable on and can really bring their A game. Totally agree. It's very much the go hard or go home situation here. And to have a map that they're both strong on is going to create a very interesting dynamic. And so far, that looked like a very tight round. Uh, it really just came down to that final 20 seconds. And both teams played it pretty well. It was really just some small mistakes in the end from Breadbaggers, just giving too much control away. So I'd like to see Breadbaggers try and play a little bit more aggressive this time, try and mess up with fans attack, just to slow them down a little bit more, and also just make them feel less comfortable for that execute. Now they start heading on in, and so the first round going in favor of the attackers maybe proves that uh, those hard breacher bans not as impactful as perhaps Breadbaggers were hoping for. Again, with this being more of a comfortable map for both teams, they should be uh, relatively aware of how to attack this with limited resources and so uh, nice that that's not going to make this too tilted of a match we're not going to see it go one way or the other uh, too too decisively which is always exciting to see for now though um the guys over on fans are still just going to take this uh, relatively simply just break up those barricades get your drones on in and uh if the defense want to change it up they could have some roamers down on that bottom floor again with this uh, operator lineup being brought they have the opportunity to they certainly have the tools but so far, they really haven't been willing to. Yeah, that's one thing that I remember from the last game that we casted of uh, Breadbaggers together was players like Tito's, for example, he was playing quite aggressive and it was calculated. It wasn't like it was just blind aggression. And that's just definitely something we haven't seen on the defense so far. I really like Breadbaggers to start to just push out here because again, they've given fans a lot of control. They've got those players below to get vertical, uh, which worked pretty effectively last time. They weren't able to stop impact tricks. 
But either way, it just meant that players on site were pushed out into corners that they didn't want to be in. Minute 30 on the clock now, and an interesting drone from LSG gives him a ton of information and actually sees the C4 being prepped by the Valve. Probably don't want to approach that wall. Ton of information just being uh, fed thanks to the IGL of fans. Just very, very useful to have. I mean, if you can count the players on site, you can maybe even confirm that nobody's roaming downstairs, and you can pull Wolfies up, which would be really, really helpful for you. Jolton again on these windows has caused a bit of a problem. Let's see if this actually hits. Again, there was information being played uh, by LSG, but unfortunately that frag grenade doesn't really go anywhere that it needed to. Maybe got some utility, which was his goal. It's tough to really see, but uh, no frags coming from it now. Again, you've got a lot of frag grenades to work with on this lineup, so it's not the end of the world. Yeah, I feel like they're tunneling a bit on trying to open this bar wall in particular. They could have gone for the other wall. It wasn't really being guarded for impacts there. And even if they lobbed the frag grenade over that, they might have been able to take out the smoke, which might have been much more beneficial for them. Either way, that wall did finally go open. So they finally got this line of sight through to bar, which means this execute's going to be even more tricky for the defense to hold off against. But there is only 30 seconds to go here, Jesse, which means that it's still going to be quite crazy for the attack to have to rush through and secure this. For sure, the phone calls are going to help them quite a bit. Hopefully they can use their ears to spot out some of these players with the one frag advantage. They do have a couple of tools that they can work with. Should be able to find some openings. Guy on a bear is dealt a little bit of damage. Now he's playing this long angle. Got to be careful of some thrown uh, utility being tossed at him. LSG can start this plant. His teammates are all dying though, but they're getting the refrags as well. Inro gets a double. He's inside of the other bomb site and Vivid being down isn't going to be too much help at all. Fans are there for round number two and they'll walk away with it. Oh man, there were so many players down in that final moment there, the final 15 seconds, but the attack is coming through strong, and again, I just don't think that bread baggers are doing enough to repel the forward progression from this attack. They just were so comfortably in study for most of that round, they had all the time in the world to deal with that wall. They had some great droning, they were using their utility, they finally got it open, and just because the defense didn't have any other foothold, and the flank watch seemed to be pretty good too, there was just nothing the defense could do, and you're seeing it there. There's only five frags over those two rounds. Only two players really getting the look in. So hopefully we see Breadbaggers start to push out a bit more. They are rotating bombsite, which is fantastic to see. We praised their trophy statue uh, hold last time. Let's see if they pull something out very similar this time. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised they didn't want to go here a little bit sooner, of course, Defenders because uh, they have some interesting strats with it. Back. The Goyo, the Clash, I mean, this is clearly something that they've practiced a, long, uh, a lot of the times. And from what we've seen, and just based on their win rate, it should be relatively effective, even going up against fans. Um, so uh, I'm excited to see what this actually uh, looks like in terms of where they're playing their players in particular. Um, the Goyo is an interesting choice. I think I, I mean, I always like to, to highlight a Goyo um, just because he is a little bit newer into the game and uh, really a, a lot of strats and a lot of potential, I feel, in my mind that haven't really gotten used, at least at the highest level, perhaps the Invitational coming up um, very shortly here. Wow, that's what, two days away now? It's kind of exciting, but um, yeah, I'm just yeah. see what the Goyo can do. Yeah, it is super exciting about the Invitational only being a couple of days away. And you're so right with Goyo. Uh, we've seen some teams use him pretty effectively and he can change just the way a strat plays out. Uh, so it's, I love seeing Goyo picks at the moment because we can really see a lot of innovation with how they are used. And it can change completely how a site has traditionally been held and how an attack will deal with that. So if Breadbaggers can use that to great effect, then this might be what they need to start to get around back. Just creeping around right now, and you can still leave Goyo shields placed in uh, positions where they're going to be hard to get past, right? You're going to need to vault that Goyo if you want to get on in or destroy it. Um, so that's really not a great option either way. You're going to have to waste utility or put yourself in a lot of danger jumping into that uh, over that one that's just facing on into the master bedroom. So some of these are in really like smart positions, and uh, I'm interested to see how these attackers deal with it. Luckily for them, they have a fair amount of utility. Like they got two frag grenades, they got some lifelines as well, so uh, that's nice for them. But they still want to deal with some other things with that utility too. You know, you don't want to have to go up against a clash without frag grenades or lifelines. So I don't know. This is uh, gonna be a game of choosing for them. It wouldn't surprise me if they've got to maybe isolate their attacks a little bit more for fans, just because you know some of these rotations are gonna be impossible to deal with without the right utility. Yeah, utility use is going to be really critical. And the fact that they've got the Goyo, uh, the Maestro, and the Clash means that, like you said, the utility from the Zofia especially is going to have to be really well thought out and used because that can help with a lot of different ways, clearing Evil Eyes, clearing Goyo Shields, and even just like stunning that Clash. 
So that's something the attack will have to think about. And they're taking a long time to think about what they're doing here because over half the round played out. They've got master bedroom control, but these impact tricks, again, just so strong for breadbaggers. Yeah, I mean, fans, I wouldn't necessarily call uh, the slowest team in the world. Like, they're not a super aggressive team either, but this is a bit slow for them. Tito's opens things up to kill onto the new beat. Wolfies was going to fall, and that puts us back down to a 5-on-4. So finally, we get a frag in this round, and it's one that's going in favor of the team currently down 2-0. So that's got to be a big sigh of relief for them. Wolfies maybe not the most crucial player, but still a good one. There's a frag grenade thrown at the Clash. Unfortunately, very little damage done. That shield having a fair amount of time to rotate to cover from that, so it's not really going to be too big of an issue for the Clash. And we'll still try to get on in as this time is really becoming a factor for the attack. Yeah, maybe that frag grenade a bit misplaced as well. If he'd hit the Goyo shield with that, that might have actually done a lot of damage mm. to the Clash. Clash getting away pretty unscathed there though, but Goyo will go down to his own shield. And this is a pretty explosive attack looking like it's going to come out of fans here through the statue door. Uh, absolutely under fire here on defense. This is tough. A lot of utility gets thrown in. The Clash having a tough time. Guy on a bear though, stands strong. Worried about their flank. They can't focus on that. They got to go for this plant. They'll sp uh, start it right in full view of the Clash. It doesn't really matter though. There's all the frags. Inro getting two is a really big play from him. They can try to stop this, but I don't think he's going to have the time to. It gets downed regardless, but they have the kills. It's going to be down all the way to a one on one. LSG loses it though, and Inro with a 4K comes big in this round and takes it for, uh, wow, for Breadbaggers. Their first time. They'll go down 2 1 now. Man, I thought Breadbaggers had that round secured at one stage there, but. Gotta give it to fans, they really took the gunfights and they brought it to the 1v1. And even the Thermite, the last guy alive, he flicked to the position of the Maestro. Just didn't quite land enough shots to get the win. Either way, Breadbaggers do get a round back. And I do want to go back to the Goyo discussion that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. I noticed early uh, today that Emzo, shout out to Emzo, um, he did a really nice statistical breakdown of the use of Goyo so far in Season 11 of Pro League. Mm. And uh, interesting stat here, North America, Rounds played, 38. Rounds won, 24 when Goyo is picked. So that's a 63% win rate when Goyo is in your lineup. It's pretty that's pretty good. Pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think he's a strong op, right? Was that like more or less than the, the global average? Do you know if that was uh, uh, significantly so different? So he compared three regions, um, NA, EU, Latin America, and that's the highest win rate between the three. Okay. Um, there's definitely more effect for Goyo looking like in North America and Latin America as opposed to EU. Um, but yeah, it's a really great statistical breakdown. So if you guys get a chance, drop by Emzo's Twitter and have a look because uh, yeah, it's a really great piece. For the past couple months, I've been sort of putting out, like, this is a bit of a tangent, but Emzo's been putting out like, a lot of great content for Siege. I really enjoyed uh, reading a lot of it. I haven't seen that Goya one just yet, but uh, he's uh, he's done a lot. So uh, shout out to him. Look at this operator lineup again. It seems to be the same thing like time and time again. They're on the basement floor this time. They're going to be defending inside of Kitchen. They brought uh, a mute Mozzie Vigil. So it's going to be really tough to find these roamers. Um... And I'm interested to see mostly how LSG deal with this, right? Because I think some teams have gotten a lot better at dealing with uh, Mute Mozzie than others. I think uh, in North America, Luminosity have a team that have really struggled to deal with uh, the Mute Mozzie in particular. Um, oh boy, that's so oh. good for Jolton. I don't even think he knew he was getting that kill. Maybe he had the incel, but either way, uh, that's one way to deal with the roamers. You can just find them before you even need to get in the building. Yeah, and that's going to be a tilter for Tito's, man. Like, he's yeah. going to... Just not be happy with that at all. And that's a massive pick. The Pulse taking away that Intel nice and early is good. And I really like right now that fans aren't bothering too much with this roam. Maybe they've looked into this and they've seen the Mozzie, the Mute Vigil. And they're like, guys, let's just not stress about it. Let's just put pressure on site. And then we'll deal with what comes after that. And I I'm liking that approach so far. That can be a good, uh, really good way to deal with it, you know? I mean, you don't really have to uh, hunt down those roamers. You do leave yourself open to flanks late game. That's fine as long as you watch them. Um, so, yeah, I don't uh, I don't hate that strat either. Guy on a bear has a really nice position that he's holding right now. His teammates are all dying, though, so maybe it's not quite nice enough. That's all of the roamers now still alive. Well, I should say that. There goes one. There goes two. Jolton's got a triple kill somehow in this round, and Lucas is there for the Jeez. final one. It's flawless for fans. Clearly, they're a team that doesn't mind going against Mute Mozzie. No, oh, that attack was just great. They didn't have to do anything more than what they did. Like, they assessed the situation and they just kept it simple and it, it worked so well for them and it didn't look like that breadbaggers were really prepared for them to not push that roam so the retake just really was unsuccessful um 
fantastic attack from fans. And you know what? Breadbaggers aren't even going to retry Kitchen at all. They're just going to go straight back to Aviator. Man, I wouldn't. That sounds like a, like a terrible idea, uh, just based on how poorly that round went for them. Aviator, this will be their third attempt. Again, I'd like to see something maybe just changing in the in the strategy, because uh, in those first couple of rounds, like there wasn't a whole lot of plant denial. There weren't a whole lot of like hard anchor operators. It was playing like really um, like ops with good guns, you know, ops who can roam around, and they weren't really playing to those strengths. They weren't really taking gunfights, um, and they weren't necessarily like playing that, that sort of roam game that you'd expect from them. And I think that's like fine in the sense that like Hill is a tough game, a tough map to do that on. It's tough to really just play it like peak crazy. It's tough to kind of get all over the place with it. But you know, if you're not going to play that way, why bring those offs? You know, if you can have a maestro, which now they do, um, then I think you should totally be bringing it. And I'm glad to see that they've changed that up now. Yeah, I agree. And especially the Ella, I really think the Ella needs to get early round aggressive. We saw Inuyo in one of those rounds. He got late round aggressive. He got a couple of picks on a flank, kind of on a retake, you could say. But at that stage, I think that kind of effectiveness is a little late. One way I've seen Ella play pretty effective on this bomb site before is the top of those main stairs. So you can really deny the push up main stairs, the push in the study. Slowing that down, I think it's a really critical point to stalling out this attack so far, because what they've been doing is just taking studies so fast, and then they get the vertical control in piano and library, and that's really hard to come back from. They can start on entering now. One player all the way back in spawn still, uh, Diaz Lucas. I'm not sure what's up with him, but I hope there's no actual issues for him and he can uh, get back into this match. He's not even on drones, so that's a little bit unfortunate if they're coming in this one four on five. The defenders don't necessarily know that though, so you know, keep playing and hopefully this works out for you and the uh, defenders will play a little bit uh, maybe more passive than they have to. Again, it's been a pretty uh, concise and quick clear of that bottom floor. It's what you'd want because there's really been uh, not a lot of roam game. The positioning from the Ella uh, in Rio could totally turn into something like a roam. And Tito is actually downstairs now. Oh boy, he's caught on the drone though. Surely they know. Maybe not. The Buck's just getting on cams. I don't think he's been spotted. Yeah, that drone doesn't look active and he's just going to hold a nice position here. He might be able to catch Jolton as he pushes out through this doorway. About to see this engagement and he does catch him off guard. It's the Jaeger getting the opening pick and this roam much more effective now. And it looks like fans are going to just try and flush him out as quick as possible. I ain't fine. I mean, it is a changeup. I thought that they should play a little bit more uh, defensive ops, but they just get more aggressive instead. Giddy's there on the Maestro, so a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. That doesn't hurt you at all. Bow and arrow's there to get one. Giddy with a double. Really nice shot on the LSG. Leaves just two players left alive for fans, and they're going to have to, you know, really muster up something to take down these players who are still in pretty strong positions. I mean, Bear's playing in 90 still with a deployable shield. He can really make some uh, trouble for these attackers. It's been a pretty uh, heavily focused push from one angle, right? They haven't really choose, uh, decided to spread out they haven't used 90 too much yet but man oh man this is going to be tough for them um thankfully they have a lot of time if nothing else attackers recovered the bomb diffuser and that's something i really like out of red bag is now is i feel like they're finally read into exactly what fans were doing because it wasn't really changing at all from round to round so finally we've seen a good counter here and it stalled them out they're really not sure what to do at this stage it's very obvious that there's so many crossfire angles being held that's a great shot though from bow and arrow but it's all up in a one versus three and it is closed out by breadbaggers so finally a solid counter on this bomb site now jesse and it's gonna be three two so up to the final round of the half i think that's a really important round i mean if you lose the aviator games three times then you're really starting to stress if you're uh, breadbaggers especially just the fact that you're defending it's the first round or first half of villa and man oh man this is an important game right i can't stress that enough if you win here you're top 16 you're good to go you don't have to worry you know your last five weeks of work have paid off to to your goal uh if you lose then it's out of your hands right not only is it unlikely but the rest of the night doesn't matter you're done playing um, if you lose here tonight and you just have to hope that uh, the other teams who are uh, in similar spots as you uh, have done worse than you have so it's a tough it's a scary scary thought if you lose this matchup and unfortunately for one of those two or one of these two teams that'll be reality we come in around number six and again a 4-2 split uh, better than a 5-1 but not great still for bread beggars they really want to make this a tied game 100% and fans will totally be stoked if they get that 4-2 split because like the double heart bridge ban in most circumstances you would say it would favor the defense so that should swing the map to be more defender sided. I mean so far fans have looked so good on a lot of their attacks but maybe this is a little more attacker sided. We talked a little bit in the pre-show about how this double heart bridge ban on Villa previously 
has actually surprisingly presented more attack round wins. So we might be just seeing that again, but overall I think fans' attacks have just looked really good, like quite coordinated and quite strong. <laughs> I, w I was really impressed when they attacked that bottom floor too, like it was so different, it was such a drastic uh, change to what you've been attacking those last couple of rounds, and they meant, man, they adapted so quickly, um, getting those opening frags and then turning it into a perfect round, like that's something really impressive that I think a lot of teams would struggle to, uh, to pull off, so, I mean, yeah, fans have been very good in terms of uh, isolating out what these defenders are doing, and then uh, deciding on a course of action, maybe less so in that last round, but it's hard when you're in such a huge numbers disadvantage. For sure, and something that's going to be really important for fans on this attack is shutting down that Clash. They tried really hard last time this site was held and the Clash was there, but she held strong until pretty close to the end of that round. And I think that was the big thorn in their side. So if they're able to shut out Guy on a bear a lot earlier, it might be much more favorable for them. Interesting, once, uh, once Giddy kills himself once with the Goyo, he's not going to do it again. So uh, I'm glad to see that it's changed off over to the Legion. I like Goyo, but maybe it's just not uh, not the op for him. Yeah, and again, I think without a lot of experimentation, sometimes players will find themselves in tricky situations late round due to some shield placement. Um, maybe that's what happened to Giddy previously. We'll have to wait and see. Thermite looks like he's ready to open this master bedroom wall, but they haven't seemed to have done a whole lot to prevent the impact trick again. So hopefully that doesn't keep occurring. Yeah, I mean, two impacts still being held by Giddy, so certainly that's uh, something he's got in the back of his mind, should he need to employ those. LSG has a tough task, but mostly he's been focused on just, like, getting that info for his team, making some calls, and I think that's the right way to play. When you know you're going to struggle so much getting that hard destruction down, maybe you're just better utilized with your time on focusing on calls and, you know, coordinating with the rest of your squad. This is great intel gathering on this clash as well. They're really using this to not just the effect of stunning and being a pain, but live intel, and that's really, really great. And Tito's shut off on this flank here by these track singers. He can hold this long angle though, and if they rotate around in between trophy and statue, he might be able to catch a couple off guard. They all gotta take a moment, pull some goo mines out of their feet, but then this attack can get underway. Again, a ten on, or a five on five, ten alive on the server means this is gonna get pretty spicy. Great coordination to take down Guy on a Bear. Not having a good time here on that clash. Inyo gets another one though, a counter trade, but DS Lucas is right on there to frag out on Tito. So it's headshots all the way around, a three on four. You've got Vivid and Astronomy trying to peek on in a bathroom, maybe going for a late flank, but I think he's more important holding on. The Toxic Babe just barely missing LSG. It doesn't look like it should, but it does. LSG gets it down safe and sound, and now he can just run on back outside of that doorway. A great position to plant in. You've got all the crossfires covered. That's why Giddy goes down, and now it's going to be a two on four. Vivid and Inrio, last ones alive. It's strong operators to be uh, the last men's alive, but they still got so much to work with. Jolton gets another kill on the Inrio, and it's Vivid now alone with the SMG 11. What could he possibly do? This is looking bad. His position wasn't known, so he gets a free kill, but he can't get a second. Jolton, a really huge uh, round that time, gives fans the 4 2 split. That all started with such a great clear of the clash, and we were talking about it just before they did it as well that that was going to be really critical for them to get a secure execute. And on top of that, massive mistake from the smoke there. That was two smoke grenades that just never touched the planter. So he was able just to stick that out. And by that time, the round was essentially over for the defense. Man, oh man, this is uh, starting to get bad. Um, you got to bring it back pretty heavily on your attacks now if you're bread baggers. And again, they're not for sure out of it uh, if they lose this match, but they are uh, leaving it up to fate and their odds don't look great. So this is uh, it's gotta be stressful. Look at Jolton's uh, scoreboard right now, nine, one and three, really putting up the big numbers here today. The thing I've really enjoyed by watching fans over the you know the last five weeks has been how really anybody on this team can, can frag off. I've seen matches where LSG goes absolutely huge and gets a, a crazy amount of kills. You, you know, DS Lucas is an insane fragger. I've seen him really pop off. Jolton uh, is doing really well today. Wolsey's has his moments. I mean, really, everybody on this team um, has times where they just look almost undefeatable. And it's a bit more of a split effort even in this game, right? Like, Jolton's not carrying the team on his back, but he is having a very good performance. And... Even if somebody else on the team is slipping a little bit, then it's nice that you can, you know, have somebody to fall back on. Yeah, I think also the role that he's playing mm -hmm. is so critical, or not critical, but it's... If he's stepping up, then that's really effective. Uh, on that buck role, if you have a buck player that 
is effectively doing vertical play and then either using their frag grenades or just fragging out in general. Um, that can help a lot, and I think that's really key there. Jolson has been doing really well on that on that role, and uh, of course that's helped excel his team. And I'm really curious now what will happen with their defense. Whether they'll play it similarly aggressive, because I would say those attacks were quite swift, and they punt they had some punch to it. So if their defense is similar, I, I'm just really not sure breadbaggers will be able to deal with it. Red baggers are going to have to uh, climb up a bit of a mountain, but they've got some good drone work going on right now. I mean, it's been a standard take so far. They seem to have brought all the right tools. I like the use of the Capitao. Something that wasn't seen a whole lot uh, being brought by fans. So this is a fun op that could uh, perhaps shake things up in favor of the attack because, um, well, I mean, the attack have done uh, good so far, but last time we were here, this was a successful bomb site for the defense. So hopefully Inro can uh, push some people out of position or go for some of those smoke plants if he chooses to. Otherwise, though, I mean, this squad, they're, uh, they're just going for their drones. It's pretty standard stuff all the way around, and I don't see any mistakes just yet. Yeah, and similar thing where the attack has just been given study for free, essentially. And, I mean, maybe that's just a trap. They want to be able to impact trick the only hard reach available, being those two exothermic charges. So maybe that's part of the design, but we really saw that working against bread baggers when they were defending in the first half. So I'm kind of surprised that fans are allowing them to do the same. Um, Buck below also quite freely, but Wolfsies is actually on the reroam here, trying to push towards that vertical play. So Buck getting out just at the right time. Yeah, Wolfsies applying pressure and he wasn't well known, but still that's huge. The impact fails and that will be an opened up wall. That's really big. Jolton is stepping up again with a headshot on to Giddy. So that's going to be a really impactful frag for the defense. Zofia off the board means that a lot of that utility is now going to be gone. Some window play coming from Guy on a Bear as well, dealing some shots in LSG. LSG continues to peek, though. He's got no fear. Maybe he should. He loses the gunfight, and Guy on a Bear has arrived with about 75 HP. That's a really important one to win, and he's certainly happy about it on the windows. Wolf sees now his flank also really being punished. Jolton goes down as well, but thankfully Arrow is here to maybe cover for his team because nobody else has done too well in the last 30 seconds. They've got to try and open up one more of these walls. Oh, and watch out for this flank on main stairs. Wolfsey's coming back. Dias Lucas actually gets the shot. The C4 will finish it. He's not going to survive for much longer. Tito's falls, and the shotgun finishes off vivid. That round went from really bad to a win for fans. Yeah, they really brought that back, and some great shots that were hit on site that were critical. And then that flank from Wolfsey's right at the end worked out really well. Some unfortunate timing for Tito's on that Thatcher. He did look down those stairs for the flank as it was happening, but looked away at that final moment. So, look, it's looking pretty strong for fans here. That defense looked pretty good overall. It was getting picked apart a little bit, but never fully in doubt. And now they're going to play Dining for their second bomb site. You know, uh, fans were taking a long time to ban their maps, and uh, I was worried that if this goes, like, really close, like 15 rounds, we might uh, have to worry about the time a little bit. But with how fast these rounds have been and also how few there have been, this doesn't really look like it's going to be a concern for us as uh, a 5-2 scoreline is pretty dominant. Breadbaggers not only would like to be able to, uh, you know, get some more rounds to ideally get a win, but um, more rounds would help out for your tiebreaker as well, which is going to be really crucial if you do lose. So the fact that they're getting blown out like this, the fact they're getting kind of stomped into the ground is, uh, oh boy, it's really, really tough for them. And there's a good chance they're going to fall out of that top 16 spot. They definitely need to stop the bleeding of these rounds because obviously losing one more means that they have to force it to overtime just to stay in the game. Uh, that's really daunting as it is, let alone the fact there's probably a lot of pressure on their shoulders as we keep saying about the fact it's do or die for them. They are right at the edge of that top 16 and losing this match will probably be the end of them being in that top 16. So that's a lot of pressure, especially for teams coming through these Challenger League qualifiers. Uh, Anything on top of that, such as this round difference, is just going to make it a lot worse. We'll see he's bringing out that Scorpion, try to do a little bit more work. Again, we're seeing a fair amount more Ella play since her recent buff, which is honestly a lot of people have complained, but I kind of like to see it. Uh, Ella coming back on in is at least a new splash in terms of our operator pool. At the moment on Astronomy Stairs, but clearly wanting to go a little bit, uh, you know, free flow throughout this bottom floor. Already being caught out on drones could be a bit of a problem, and uh, I'm interested to see how this uh, defense changes when you're not bringing a Mute, a Mozzie, and a Vigil. The Mozzie is there, so you've got a little bit of drone denial with you, but uh, perhaps it's the right decision to not bring all of that counter drone utility when it really wasn't uh, too big of a problem when fans were attacking themselves. 
Yeah, and a pretty direct push so far here on this attack. Similar to what we saw fans do in that first half. They're just taking what they need or what they feel comfortable taking. So nice little pot shots under the door there from Castle. Just will put some damage on top of that buck. But yeah, again, the roam relatively ignored. And I mean, this seems like it was working out better for fans, to be honest. Breadbaggers are a bit stalled out at this stage. And the fact that fans are pretty much aware of that is a bit of a concern for me because that makes it a lot easier to shut out such a linear horizontal push. It's been certainly a lot slower compared to the attack that we saw being brought by fans, which is not inherently bad, but it's certainly not great. LSG lets a drone slip past, but I think he didn't get spotted. Oh, wow. He's definitely being watched, though. Tito's and another player watching that angle, like Hawks. Bit of damage on a Tito's, but Inrio getting another frag just means that that's not going to be enough of a consolation prize. Another kill for Inrio, and man, oh, man, this is starting to get bad. We got it now at two on five. Good diffuser down, but with so much time, it might not matter. Your teammates now also fall in, and there you go, too. Jolton dies, and that's going to be Breadbagger still in it. 5-3. I have to say, I feel like fans kind of outplayed themselves in that situation. They had a, a lot of control of sight still, and uh, Breadbaggers were pushing into some kind of a trap there with that mozzie on that flank. He might have been able to get a couple in that laundry section if some of those frags hadn't come out. And they just seem to be a little over-aggressive there. We saw that castle run out trying to get that pick from the laundry doorway. I think that was probably just too much at that stage. Uh... Breadbaggers had so much work ahead of them to be able to actually take sight and either get some picks or execute. And just giving them that early advantage and even some confidence, I think it's a bit of a mistake. Some small mistakes can really mean all the difference here um, when we're coming down to the last little, uh, last few games, the open qualifier. 5-3 is our current scoreline. We're going to move over to uh, the same bomb site, which is interesting that they choose to repeat it. I guess they just feel like uh, if they don't lose the many gunfights, that this might go a little bit better. If they play a little bit more passively, probably would work a bit better. I don't know that LSG uh, taking that aggressive peak was really the play last time. So perhaps this time he plays it a little bit safer. He uh, survives for more of the round and they can... Uh, do a little bit better, and they are really committing to this top floor using reinforcements, having two of their players up right now. Um, Lucas coming down means that maybe it's uh, mostly a distraction, or perhaps it's all just for Wolfsies. LSG goes upstairs, I mean, I like that they can be kind of flexible. Typically you do see the Canadians and the Brazilian in this team, uh, that's LSG, Wolfsies, and then DS Lucas BR um, being the more aggressive players, but with how much of a tear Jolton's been on, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if they want to put him up here as well. Yeah, and I like that they've committed to doing this again because I do think there was just some fundamental issues in that first round or the first time they tried to hold this um, that they can really easily rectify. And it doesn't look like that Breadbaggers are going to change a whole lot. And it's this total psychological game, right? Breadbaggers are going to think, oh, we just won it really strong last time. Let's just do the same thing again because it worked really well. But actually what it takes is just some of those small adjustments from fans that could be the round difference. Some sneaky drones at the moment. I like the utility usage still coming in. Um, just giving yourself some opportunities to uh, to break down these castle barricades. You don't want to necessarily waste everything um, because it's going to be so important that you you know can take these down, whether that's with lifelines, fire grenades, or just punching them. Um, they're going to be a big a big like blockage for the attack. So they use their first as a thermic charge. Will this get tricked? That is the question here on Villa. Oh no, it won't. Thanks to Inrio who gets a nice kill on LSG. That's the second time he's been able to frag LSG in that spot. Can he get the second fight though? He takes a ton of damage and eventually loses it. Lucas is there, so half of his health gone, but he walks away with the kill. I think he's going to be pretty happy evening us out to a four on four. Yeah, and lucky to get that gunfight win in the end because the IQ did do some damage and it was how he died last time. And again, they just seem totally unaware of where this attack is coming from. It's pretty clear that it's going to be a horizontal linear push and uh, they're just running into these line of sights that are being held. It's a five, a four versus three now. They've still got half the round to play out, so that's a lot of time to have to stall out. Oh, there's a, there's a peak from Wolfies, but he doesn't really have the shot. Guy in a bear takes down his teammate of Jolton's. So this player at a disadvantage just grows. He's got a good angle, though. Oh, he fires off his gun and reveals his position, though. He's now got to flee and maybe try to come at it at a different angle. He's now alone in the one on four, two as Tito's takes down Arrow. Vivid starts this plant, but Wolsey's can't get the angle unless he actually walks in. He's got a rotation, but it's being watched. Can he find a shot somewhere in here? Probably maybe one or two, but this is going to be tough to find all of them. Looking for them around the bomb chassis. 
none just yet. There's that coverage from up above, too. Here's a free kill. No. Tito's is ready for it, and Wolsey's goes down. Breadbagger's on a bit of a tear. That's two in a row. Yeah, they are bringing this back. They're digging deep, and look, fans have to be worried about this. Momentum is a huge thing in any sport, but R6 also. Mm -hmm. And they've got the momentum now. It's only 5-4. They're one round away from equaling it up, and they're going to go back to Aviator, and they won it pretty well last time, but Breadbagger's had a good start to this attack. So if they can tie it together... I don't see how they wouldn't be able to get this round. And if we get it to 5-5, five, five, could be in for a very, very tight finish to this map. Yeah, I mean, just like that, a 5-2 can really start to slip away from you. So uh, good from um, the guys over on Breadbaggers to bring this back, right? It's very tough when you talk about momentum. It's tough sometimes to get back in that mental state of like, we can still win this. This is still a very important game. We're not going to fall down and die uh, right here. So... They are clearly fighting for it, and you love to see it uh, in the second last game of the closed qualifiers. We are going to come back up to this top floor, though, and so this is going to be a little bit difficult for them. This is the uh, bomb site that they successfully defended in round number seven. They are one for one on it so far, and um, I don't know. In terms of the strategy, I thought it was fine. I liked the flexibility last time with Wolfsies not being afraid of just running downstairs and um, trying to disrupt the buck play. He maybe didn't have the timing down perfectly uh, in round number seven, but... You know, at least that pressure's there, and he did eventually come around to get some good flank kills too, which helped to win that round. So, Wolfsey's is going to be a big player to watch for me in terms of just who he's able to spot out when he moves downstairs, and at what time is he going to start, you know, heading down those red stairs. I'm super curious to see what the defense will do about the study and the vertical control that keeps being established really early in these rounds. I think, again, if the defense are able to prevent that a little bit, uh, it'll just help them be more comfortable late rounds. And that's going to come down to this roam. And they've tried to time this mid-round or late roam, but that can really go against you if the attack end up getting too much control. For example, if they get some of those walls open on site, Sometimes your anchor operators can't weather that storm long enough for a successful flank. Uh, so the timing is going to be everything. Falcams unfortunately getting spot out by the IQ. So good work from Inro to be able to uh, catch those. It means that they're not going to have to uh, be worried about a flank maybe as precisely. But Wilsey's already playing downstairs. So you can tell that, you know, the want is there to go for something aggressive. And um, if it works as well as it did in the previous round, then that could be really deadly for him. There's also notably no, like, uh, flank watch being brought in terms of, like, operators. You know, there's no gridlock being brought. There's no nomad, which maybe would help out against that. Neither of those options being employed here. Uh, mostly it's been all just, like, a group up inside of study. Um, and they're just starting to try to open up walls and, you know, going for drones. Yeah, and LSG on the Valkyrie, they're playing the 90 corner again, playing behind that pillar. Last time, again, he was probably a little too aggressive peeking out. Giddy does open it up, though, taking out Jolton. That's a big pick. We've emphasized Jolton's impact so far, and now he's the first one off the board. Yeah, especially on the smoke. I mean, that's a good player and a good operator. That's a really nice find for Breadbaggers. They still want to dislodge LSG, who's playing inside a 90. And he's gotten a little bit over-aggressive in the past on this spot, but he might have to if a frag grenade will catch him here. It's sailed in, and it hits him. Perfect spot on. Puts you into a two-player advantage now, and that's going to be a, a, another really nice find because LSG in a strong position that time. Here's Wolsey's trying to equalize that with a throwable of his own, but it's nowhere near it needs to be. And Inro, expecting the flank, pushes it prematurely and takes down Wolsey's just as we pass that one minute mark left. This has been a very, very clean attack coming on out. Keep in mind, this is to tie the game, so this is really going to be a tipping point in terms of rounds. If these last two players can't clutch it, then this is going to be a really horrible mental state for fans losing three in a row. Oh yeah, that's going to be a real struggle to hold it against, but they've got two operators that are strong anchor operators, or strong late round operators, being a Maestro and the Jaeger, both with very strong weapons. The Jaeger does find one onto the buck. Final 30 seconds here. We did see a bit of a rotate coming out of this attack, and a readable push through studies, so this could be winnable here, Jesse. Yeah, they're going to start that plant. They found a way through Diaz, but he's ready for it. He just pushes. Oh, and he stops the plant. That's so big. He went down, but it's only a 2-1-1. -on -one. And with Arrow having that Alda, he can certainly win this back. A 1-on-1 -on -one of this plant goes down. Going for this gunfight. Inro so low in HP. He gets it. Giddy has to get off the flank. No, Bow and Arrow clutches oh, no it. Way. Somehow they pull that round out of the gutter. And fans will push it to match point. There's no way that they should win that round. Oh, man. That's, uh... Look, we're talking about how... 
the equalization there would have been a bit of a, a struggle for fans to deal with. But on the on the contrary, man, that's that's going to be a difficult round for bread baggers to swallow because that was theirs by all the rights. That is just awful for them. And to make matters worse, uh, I have an update in terms of uh, the rest of these games. Slaughterhouse won their match. It's another team uh, in contest for these final three spots so the fact that they won means that if you lose this it's even more likely still not confirmed but still very likely that you will not be uh, one of those final teams uh, so wow this is this is tough you lost that one it was so close to being a victory but you still have an opportunity to win this two more rounds to push into ot and then three rounds in overtime they gotta keep their head in the game i'm very surprised to see that fans are going straight back to kitchen dining Considering they had two round losses uh, already on that, and we haven't seen them attempt the other bomb site that people play, being statue and trophy. So I don't know whether they see something or know of something that they really can fix to counter the attack that's happening. But uh, I don't know. I feel like this has got a favor bread baggers at this stage, um, and that would mean that bread baggers again would be within one round of at least getting it to OT. Fans are a team that you know. For most of these qualifiers, I don't remember even seeing this team until like late week three or maybe even week four i mean this is not a squad that was on most people's radars at the start of the qualifiers struggled to rack up points early if they could uh, you know come on out in the very last qualifier they walked into this week i think in 19th place so just get your last few crucial points right here i mean that would certainly be a you know a strong boost moving into the qualifiers uh, that are closed so they got to be feeling it now. They've got to get one more in the next two or two more in the next five to be able to take this match. And again, they're playing it pretty aggressive. Look at this heavy roam strategy, defending on dining for the third time. They've lost it so many times before. I'm just curious what gives them confidence that uh, it can work for them this time. I have to agree. And again, they just had so many aggressive peaks that really could have worked out against them. The Jaeger did manage to win that gunfight with the IQ last time. Um, but again, that was kind of unnecessary. The IQ is pretty trapped in that little bicycle storage room. You don't have to be peeking that. And even the castle that walked out to try and do that impact trick, he didn't even have to move in that situation. So it's just these small things that if fans do tidy it up, maybe they can get these rounds. But at the end of the day, I think breadbaggers have a lot of confidence attacking this. They're clearly not changing it a whole lot. So it's going to be a really, really interesting round. And obviously this could mean the map. I'm interested if these attackers are going to be focusing very much on that top floor where there are a few roamers. LSG, of course, um, up here, and I believe he's got Jolton with him. No, Jolton's down here on this bottom floor, so it might just be LSG alone up there. There are quite a few attackers, at least two up on this top floor, trying to hunt him down. So taking that ground is going to be important, but LSG hits the shot first. Inrio goes down, and that's the IQ off of the board. Inrio, maybe the top fragger for this team as well, means that you're not feeling too good to be able to hold this one. Four kills is all that's going to uh, separate fans from a win. Yeah, no, Impact Trick coming out there, though. So that wall is going open in Laundry. So that gives a lot of pressure onto site now. It starts to help the attackers a lot. Thermite just ate a lot of damage, though. He's down to pretty much 50 HP. It's a nice angle being held here by the Buck. Could work against him. Doesn't hit his shots under the door. One minute to go. And look, LSG still has this vertical control. He could flank onto this Buck through Bathroom or around through master if he's not careful and yeah the attacker gonna have to start working some picks on side if they're gonna get this back i was actually not conceding that top floor why would he and the attackers kind of falling off recognizing they need to start focusing on this bomb site guy on a bear has a castle barricade to keep him safe for a little while but that could get opened up if one of those impact uh, grenades get utilized so this is a little bit scary thankfully tito's equalizes so that's a whole lot of weight off your shoulder jolton's been such a big fragger Four fans in this matchup. The MP should be able to destroy that um, evil eye, so you won't have to worry about that when you go for the plant. Starting to open up the wall now. Does it get tricked? It doesn't look like it. The castle barricade gets opened up as well. However, that wall didn't get opened. Bow and arrow is right behind it. He gets one, but then fragged right off. Giddy can walk on in. His teammate guy on a bear are getting a couple of kills. Two defenders now to try to hold on. Wolf sees and Lucas both still approaching back to this bomb site. Giddy going for this plant. Lucas sees him. Can he get the shot though? Tito's, what are you doing? Oh, he wins the gunfight regardless, and fans. They'll take the round, getting off of the plant? What happened in the end there? Just the crucial picks. Oh my god, that's going to be the game. 7-4. Yeah, I think that was the Ella coming through in clutch in that final moment, just able to get the pick onto the planter. And Breadbag is 
so many mistakes in that final 20 seconds. First, it came to that Zofia with a double mistake, concussing both of them uh, by accidentally shooting the wrong grenade. And then the impact grenade onto the castle barricade destroyed the thermite breach so that wall didn't get opened in pantry. Could have been a really critical line of sight and a strong position. The maestro was able to peek out eventually and get a, a kill out of that. So uh, breadbaggers are definitely going to be disappointed with how that ended. Um, but look, a strong map from fans. And with that, fans should secure a spot in the top 16. The fact that the other teams um, that were competing for this spot also won their game, Senshi 7-5 over Joe Esports and Slaughterhouse 7-4 over Team Reckless, I'm pretty sure that means that that is going to be it for our top 16. Senshi, Slaughterhouse, and, uh, well, now fans should be rounding out our, uh, our numbers unless Drac Esports can pull out the overtime, well can pull up the comeback against run it back and then get top four that should mathematically be our final top 16 teams so i mean we've got one more game to watch tonight but uh the chip should be all down at this point everybody should know what's going on and who's going to be uh coming back after the invitational is over i hope you'll uh, join us after the musical break so we can end out these qualifiers with one last game i'll see you then
Yeah, the line wrapped around the building like the bow on the gift box. Skinny jeans, small tees, Jordans, and thrift socks. The chicks rock yoga pants, sweaters, and spot scarves. And congregated clubs, coffee shops, and the dark parks. It all starts late. People wait at the gate. The gatekeeper think we ain't equal. Security hate people. The straight treat you like three stacks and outcasts. Those with clout pass, the rest folk out cash. As you enter the spot, temperatures hot. Young ballers spin it, hip in the guap. Pip in the pot, sip when they pop. The bottles put your tip in the pot. Or let the brown look at hit you from the split and then watch. So with the gal in my wind up, the body like so. And the man in my love, all shit, party like bro. It's ladies night. There's maybe mama or maybe wife. Looking for love in this crazy life. Right there.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our final match of the night. Now, after that last round transpired, there was still some ambiguity. Um, it was going to be tough, but it technically was still possible for Senshi to lose their match, have a very low tie break, and then not make it due to not having enough points. However, they've gotten default win here in round number nine. Just because of the luck of the draw, there was not a number of teams, and they got lucky, which means they can't lose, which means the top 16 are going to be closed and we have our next game for you. Again, I'm joined by uh, Keglenek observing for us and Raven joining me as my caster for the final match of the night, Slaughterhouse versus Bird and Biceps on Clubhouse. Yeah, Ken, for this one, as you were saying, top 16 has been locked per your calculations. So this is just for bragging rights as well as potentially some seeding changes. Not sure how dramatic that could be within the top 16, but either way, for a good match on Clubhouse. So again, both these teams locked in. Seeding can still change. Uh, I don't know the exact math on who can end up where, but these two teams are locked in for top 16 for sure. Perhaps uh, this game, you know, it still has some significance. We still care about who's going to be, you know, having an easier seed and who's going to be having a harder seed. But more or less, this is going to be more so just a game for, you know, having a little bit of fun, ending off these qualifiers with hopefully a good matchup. And, uh, yeah, just showing the viewers what they've got because uh, Slaughterhouse, I think, have a lot to prove going up against Burden Biceps, who have uh, a lot of well-known names on their team. For sure, it's definitely, at anything, good practice for Slaughterhouse going into that top 16. Burden Biceps have a few experienced players with this. Slaughterhouse, you could say, maybe on the up-and-coming trend. And, uh, look, these bands aren't showing us a whole lot different from what we'd expect for Clubhouse. Seeing the Capital pretty common. A hard breach ban is also quite common. Usually the Maverick, though, they've gone for the Habana this time, just meaning that you will have to be proficient uh, at using Maverick to open hatches for that church defense. Uh, and then the Valkyrie ban, obviously, just to deny some defender intel and maybe prevent some more free roaming, something like that. Well, I can already tell you what we're doing for this very first round, just based on these operators. We've got the classic roam strategy uh, often employed by space station gaming this is uh, the exact standard lineup we typically see you're gonna have a really heavy roam here you're gonna have mutant uh, mozzie roaming on that top floor more likely than not vigil can kind of go back and forth uh, place a lot on that first floor you're gonna have a lot of uh, castle barricades to help them out as well it's gonna be so so difficult to root these defenders out from uh, the positions that they choose to play Ah, oh, this is kind of uh, the new the new strat that's really defining clubhouse, isn't it? The way that mute mods get played almost every single round now has been, uh, you know, really interesting to see develop. Yeah, teams all around the world are really adapting this strat, and uh, they have their own little differences. So it'd be interesting to see how Bird and Bicep decide to play it out on this defense. But yeah, it's a pretty difficult roam to actually clear if you choose to hard push and clear it. Yeah, Some teams opt to try and find a hole and just push straight to site. I've seen teams rush blue or even find an opening through dirt tunnel. So maybe that is what Slaughterhouse will do. Or maybe they'll try and hunt this room. I'm, I'm curious. I hope, I hope you have an answer for me. Is there like any differences in the Australian way of playing this? Or do they basically just do it the same way as what we're seeing right here? Because this is pretty typical NA play. Yeah, cool. Yeah, quite similar to what we're seeing here. Um, Fnatic especially have played this room quite a lot, and uh, a couple of teams that uh, kind of mid-tier A and Z have also really adapted this strat, played it pretty similarly. Um, there's a couple more baits that you see though, where they set it up pretty heavy with the Mute Jammers and the Mozzie Pests, but they actually just bail off site. So they make the attackers use that utility to clear it, but it's, there's actually no room to clear. Right. Um, sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, it can be tough to know when these defenders actually choose to fall back just because it's possible to drone them, right? So things can get pretty slow even if you're not staying up there for too long. Um, these defenders seem to be pretty focused on the bomb site, though. Already it's a 4 on 4 and they're in. 3 on 3 now as Cry Magic Not Nova will trade off a kill apiece. Wolfie's going to start this defuse as we hit that 2 minute mark on the clock. His teammates are fragging for him, too, so this just might work. Avian wants to get in, but he can't. All the frags going down now. Cry Magic has come back to the bomb site, but all of his teammates have fallen. He's got to watch out behind him. It's Wolf to see who finishes off the kill. Slaughterhouse taken very, very fast round number one. Yeah, I love this. Uh, it's like I was saying earlier, some teams will choose just to ignore that room clear because it can be quite tricky, and they choose to push down dirt or blue, and that's exactly what Slaughterhouse did. They caught them off guard. That room didn't get back quick enough, and that made that re uh, retake very tricky. And uh, a team ace there from Slaughterhouse, <laughs> everybody pitching in for one kill. Uh, great start for them. They're going to be quite happy with uh, that, and you were kind of talking about that before the, the round actually got underway, that, you know what, one way to counter this is just to... Uh, rush on into the sites and you know sometimes the defenders aren't going to be ready for you win those early gunfights and that can be good enough um there were some really good um youtube videos being posted um in the community on just like why that sh like shouldn't be able to work um the way that like space station have played this um where they like make sure they have a lot of openings so they get back to site really really quickly um perhaps that rotation just wasn't fast enough for burden biceps they clearly think that uh they can be a bit faster this time in terms of coming back to the bomb site. It also could be just the case that it wasn't called early enough that, you know what, they're all in bomb site. You guys need to get down here. To me, it felt like they probably could have rushed down a little bit quicker um, if they knew what was going on a little sooner. Yeah, I think maybe it was an intel thing because I was noticing the outlines coming back a little late and they would have had that intel quite early that the, the two players were pushing through blue at least. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of surprised that they went back quicker, but this time it looks like they're not doing such a heavy roam. Obviously they've opted not to bring the castle this time. They've got a Kaid instead. Just to create more of a, a hassle at those hatchets just means that Maverick does have to be perfect. Otherwise, they'll have to use a lot of EMPs to clear those uh, electric core charges. Could also be just like the um, the lesion drones, because oftentimes that can be like your primary information gathering, right? If you don't have enough uh, goo mines spread out, you don't know where they're coming from. That can be a really good early warning sign from uh, the play from Avian. But whatever it was, um, they've tried again. And as you mentioned, a little bit different operator selection with um, Blarn going over to the Kaid. I think I like it just because that hard destruction was relatively crucial for uh, Slaughterhouse last time. And you can already see like Bravo Dogs down in the basement. He was a big roamer last time. Whether Zoinkers and Cry Magic want to do uh, something like that as well, where they just play a little bit more, you know, close into the bomb sites. Um, I don't see them on the map. Bravo Dog's there, Cry Magic is there. So this is actually just like bringing a lot of that, like, counter drone utility while still keeping everybody relatively close to the bomb site. Yeah, and they've just dedicated a lot of Blowtorch to opening up dirt, which I'm really surprised about, considering that they've only got exothermic charges and the Maverick Blowtorch to really deal with those hard walls. So they've really emphasized a lot of that use into dirt, and that means that if both the main hatches here, bar and kitchen, are electric clawed, uh, they will have to use those EMPs to clear that, which could just mean that some other utility isn't cleared, such as ADSs and mute jammers. Let's see how that goes. Avian can impact trick also if they wish to use exothermic charges in kitchen. Ooh, an angle from Wolfsey. Sees some people dancing below him. Can't quite get the angle to get the kill though. Little bullets getting pumped into Avian, that would be Wolfie up the top, who's able to uh, find one shot, but Avian now will know better and is likely not going to play that position again. Could make that kitchen hatch easier to open, a shot from Blarn will take down Wolfie though, so now it becomes a lot better. The fact that you challenge a thermite up top in kitchen means that that's going to be totally impossible to open up. There's another double kill from Boop though, a triple as he's just walking through dirt and finding every kill there is to find. JC's behind them, but man, they don't even need the support. Boop is doing it all on his own here. Yeah, losing three to dirt, that's going to put <laughs> the defense in a very bad position. And look, it's all up to Zonkis and Blan here. They are pretty split in a nice shot from JC and dirt. That deletes the guy in blue, which means Blan, all by himself here in church. He's got 30 seconds to hold this out. 
Yeah, I mean, this is going to be a tough hold for him. He's got the TCSG, of course, just watching on an armory at the moment. The they just now pick up the diffuser, so that's actually going to take them a little bit of time to rotate back in. Unfortunately, Blarn doesn't really seem like he wants to uh, go on in there. Likely has some info from his team, so he can know when he needs to push. Swaggy starts that plant now, and Blarn may choose to start moving. Yes, he does, creeping around, looking for an angle, but Swaggy's not going to give it to him. Still slowly walking, crouch walking in through Moto. Gonna open things up, but Nova will now have that information and can win that gunfight with a quick shot to the head. Slaughterhouse take round number two and continue their streak. That was just all off the back of that insane push through dirt. Um, there's Zofia just picking up that triple kill. Uh, I find it unbelievable that they lost uh, three players to that dirt tunnel. They really just wanted to try and refrag that out, I guess. But not even able to picking up one of those refrags really hurt them. And uh, they're not going to try that again. Jesse, they're going to go straight to gym bedroom and try and get a defense round on the board. Which I think is the right play. Um, I don't think you want to keep on holding downstairs. Maybe you uh, play with a couple of, uh, yeah, harder anchor operators, but whatever. Uh, upstairs is not a bad strat either. Crime Magic moving over to the Goyo, and um, we saw it a couple of times back on Villa, maybe just once. Um, but Clubhouse is really where this operator seems to shine, at least from the games that I've seen. Um, likely to help out the roam more so in cash. He's putting the first one just construction, and I don't think he's going to put any more farther that way. So putting one there, I've seen them just like sprinkled throughout the bomb site. You could see them on the bed sometimes, just maybe over by that uh, north doorway inside of A. You will put one in cash as well, so... Um, yeah, I mean, I like the Goyo strats here, but this isn't anything out of the ordinary coming from BNB. Yeah, it's got some good delay to it, and it's really traditional that a lot of teams, when they attack this bomb side, they will take that CCTV cash section, mm -hmm. uh, and you want to use anything possible to delay that. Not only is the Goyo shield going to do that, but his extra utility, whether it's the C4 or impacts, um, going to be really, really strong in that situation. So now we can start to see these attackers work their way in towards it. Of course, uh, coming from this east side is what they would like to be able to do. And they're going to be able to uh, come in contact with those Goyo shields at some point if they choose to keep pushing through this way. Slaughterhouse not wanting to rush things, of course. Um, just take their time. I did cast Slaughterhouse on this map a couple of days ago where they managed to secure the win and have some uh, very flashy plays in, in that same time. So... Hopefully they can uh, do a similar thing here, although I also hope that it's a little bit closer of a game, um, because at the moment 2-0 is not in super inspiring as casters and as viewers. Maybe we'd like to see a little bit more competition from BNB, but it's early. We've only seen one site. I don't want to count them out just yet. Yeah, and just quickly looking back at the statistics that you mentioned earlier that were uh -huh. provided by Talon. Shout out to Talon. Um, Bird and Bicep have a much higher win rate on this map. Um, played, I think it was eight times as I was scrolling through just then. Uh, Clubhouse has played eight times with an 87.5% win rate, whereas Slaughterhouse have played it 10 times for a 60% win rate. Um, so, historically, in terms of these stats, you've got a favor Bird and Bicep, but so far Slaughterhouse have really taken it to them. And these attacks have been quite efficient. The one thing these stats don't tell you is who those wins were against. There's a lot of teams in these qualifiers that are very true. Frankly, you're going to beat them whatever map you go to um, if you're a good enough team. So uh, perhaps those wins were on less favorable squads. Here's Boop now in a gunfight, though. Just trying to get the C4. Can he get it? Oh, he runs away fast enough. That'll be good enough. His teammate Blarn, uh, well, the enemy team, Blarn going to be able to take down Not Nova. So you're now uh, low on man counts. That's a little unfortunate, but JC opening things up in the cache is going to make life very, very difficult for Avian, and he's going to have to pull off something pretty crazy if he doesn't want to die in the next couple of seconds because the pressure is really being placed by Slaughterhouse. They throw in some utility, open up some holes, and this last angle might be the one that seals it. It's Avian still very much stuck here. There he goes. Yeah, but he's managed to burn so, so much time, and Zoink is there still in a pretty strong position with that shield at construction. I think the assistance in the Maverick maybe came a little bit too late on that side wall, the cache says. If that came a little bit earlier, Avian would have had to put himself in that tricky position, and maybe they could have got that pick earlier. And now, all of a sudden, 30 seconds to go, it's a 4 versus 4. It's really starting to favor the defense in this stage. Oh yeah, I mean, they've got uh, a lot of time to waste. There goes the last Toxic Babe into construction. So you're st uh, halting the plants a little bit now. Flash goes through the hole. Swaggy's getting kills. Double one onto Blur in his second of the round. You've still got to watch out for uh, a couple more of these anchors who are 
lurking around can go for some flanks if bravo dog feels up for it boop gets taken down by cry magic cry gets a second actually so now this kill advantage going in favor of the defense again another one cry match with three and jc where are you nowhere near the bomb site he can jump on in now but he's got no hope bird and biceps take round number three thanks to successful defense on gym bedroom yeah a bit of a tale of timing there for the attack they really could have done that a lot more efficiently really that maverick is uh Bit of a spotlight for me just a little slow on the cash stairs and then that final rotate not really being a part of the action at all when his team are trying to push site not really coordinated precisely enough and it means that the defense will finally get their first round they're actually going to go back to church arsenal they think that they can actually secure it this time all right um they're still bringing the mute mozzie combo probably going to do what they did in round number two and just decide oh they're not they're gonna bring the goyo instead okay so again, probably not going to go on a crazy roam just based on the op selection um, coming out from BNB. Probably just going to want to play it a little bit more passive downstairs. Bravo Dog using most of those mute jammers uh, to deny those hard destruction walls rather than uh, stopping drones. But of course, you can do a little column A, a little column B. Um, Crime Magic on the Goyo, he's currently upstairs. I doubt he places any of the Vulcans up there. I would imagine we'd see some of these, like, I've seen them going into Moto. I've seen them at the end of Dirt Tunnel. Uh, I've seen them in Oil Pit, actually. Is an interesting one um, that can be spotted out sometimes, but uh, we'll see. He hasn't placed any down just yet. No, and look, we talked about Goyo a bit today, and he's an interesting operator to keep an eye on to see exactly how those shields work out, how that can change a defense. Not sure they'll really stick too much to a room here, though. Looks definitely more sight heavy this time, especially having no effect in previous rooms. So maybe a good read there from Burn Bicep. Well, the attackers get unleashed again. There's one just in blue, and we'll put another in dirt or in oil pit. So this is kind of what I'm talking about. It can give you a good angle to just peek on up with a lot of cover, and then once they eventually push, um, you can uh, sort of halt them. The last one will go up in dirt, where if you put it correctly, it's impossible for the attackers to get past without destroying or vaulting, and that's a very important characteristic of those shields. Now, Boop is able to find a C4. That is going to be unfortunate. Oh, just hits him. Boop will fall to that beautifully placed uh, C4 thanks to Bravo Dogs. So already an early player advantage going the way of BNB. The Zofia is off the board. You're quite happy. Yeah, for sure. It's a lot of utility off, and that's some soft breach that is not going to be able to be used against things like the Evil Eyes or the Guyo shields. It's quite critical, and it's a really big pick there. As we see, some EMP tricking going to have to come out so that this exothermic charge can go down without Ooh. the Electric Claw denying it, and the hatch will get open as Blonde's tagged running away from the hatch, but either way, this attack just not going as smooth as last time. No, certainly not. Uh, losing a player early is never too fun. Larn does escape with his life, which is quite good for the defense. Um, he was in a little bit of danger, and I you know, I don't necessarily love the fact that he's trying to trick that. We've seen it a couple of times, but typically that doesn't really work. you got to be pretty perfect, and the attackers um, maybe need to miss time a little bit. So, well, either way, he gets away. It's not uh, the end of the world for him. This top floor control through the kitchen is going to be important. Just based on where Not Nova's playing, it looks like they're going to want to open up that hatch. But with one being opened up, he still does have one of those Texan Dynamites. So probably going to be placed over towards kitchen hatch, if, uh, if I had to guess. Yeah, and as we come into the final minute here, um, the Thermite is going to start to breach open this church wall. And if they do get this open, that's actually going to be a lot of pressure put onto the defense. And they might be ready or be able to get that execute down, probably planting behind those black boxes. But Blan is in the most critical position that they need to flush out here. And they know exactly where he is. This is definitely possible. As Crime Magic, though, he does find Wolf. This defense more of an advantage. Yeah, that's a great one to find. There's another one as Zoinkers picks up Not Nova. It's going to be Swaggy and JC, the last two remaining players. JC runs in, but he takes too much. And that's going to be one of them down. Bravo Dog gets his double Swaggy all alone in a one on four. 30 seconds. Doesn't have that diffuser. Not a lot of things going his way. Walking on into church. Goes back past the church wall now through the hallway. Doesn't really know which angle he wants to pick. He's got to be. Moving things a little bit quicker, he can't though. Cry Magic is there for Bird's biceps, and they equalize at a 2 2 scoreline. Some really, really great crossfires and just teamwork coming out there from Bird and Biceps. They were able to just hold that attack off beautifully, and that first pick, I've got to say, was probably super important. That Zofia just not able to deal with a lot of the gadgets that were down there for the defense, giving them that intel. Uh, I think that was a big hole for the attack for that whole, uh, that whole round. 
finally we're going to see a CCTV cache, which is uh, nice for me because we get a little bit of variety. Um, hopefully it's not their best bomb site because they can't go here twice, playing it for the first time in round number five, um, unless they lose it, I guess. Um, but who knows? Bravo Dog going back over to the Maestro. That's pretty important as you're going to um, defend inside a garage. You know, his evil eyes are so important here for information. The Attackers Alda can be quite, quite powerful. Um, even if you play somebody else in there, like, those evil eyes are going to help them out a ton. So I think bringing a Maestro on this site is uh, a very good decision coming out from Bravo Dog. Yeah, I agree. And Maestro just. He's an operator. You can't really overlook for a lot of your defense lineups. There's just too much that's good about him at the moment. Even with the ACOG gone on the older, that gun is still its still a bullet hose at heart. Um, if they're going to funnel through a doorway or a hallway, then if you've got the older, you can definitely secure a couple of picks or you can hold that down pretty easy. So a relatively standard setup, you know, there is something to be said about uh, VODs that are going to be available. Um, I think probably we do see the better teams, the teams that are already locked in. At this point, both these teams are locked in for top 16. We probably do see them holding back a little bit in terms of their strats. You know, nothing that's been played from BNB has been too revolutionary. The Rome has been, you know, it, it's a little new um, on the basement whole floor, but it's not like they did anything weird with it. Um, so this round doesn't seem anything different. Likely throughout the rest of this game, we're just going to see teams playing relatively meta strats. Bravo Duck taking a little bit of damage early um, might not be the best situation in that drone hole. I mean, it can be quite deadly sometimes. Yeah, it really can. And some efficiency with the Maverick is going to be key here. If they can't get this wall open, then it's going to be really difficult to deal with. And that smoke grenade, beautifully executed. They're taking off almost half the health of that Maverick. Puts him much closer to death, which just makes this whole opening the wall thing more challenging. Yeah, they'll start at it again. Those Toxic Babes not enough. He uses all three on this wall. Seems like a little bit of waste to me uh, for Cry Magic. Those could come really, really important later on in those rounds. And while they might slow this wall getting opened up, for that last one, it didn't even really affect JC. So uh, a bit questionable utility in my mind. Certainly uh, not standard stuff, but it's his call to make, and he's uh, decided to make the way that he has. JC gets that first panel opened up, and Not Nova has no problem uh, breaking open the rest of it. And now half the round left to go. Avian is still in a very strong position in Garage. And playing that with the Kai, the TCSG with the ACOG, is really strong. And they're going to have to clear that out if they want to plant CCTV. Otherwise, they're going to have to try and do a rotate and get a cash bank going. I like Avian playing inside a Garage, dealing with this utility. The fact that he hasn't really faced too much pressure is really good for their hold. If he can stay alive in here for the rest of the round, then, man, he's going to be a huge asset coming for BNB. Prep that C4 now. He is getting stunned, and so it's going to be Slaughterhouse who are focusing on finishing him. That's not going to be a C4 that lands on anybody. The info is just not there. JC opens this round up with a kill and a cry magic, so the smoke wasting his Toxic Babes. Maybe not too crucial anyways. Almost just saw the barrel. I think he did of the Kaid, who's still just, like, bunkered up inside of Garage, <laughs> hoping that he doesn't get flashed out too, too much. There's another one that's going to be the last one that gets tossed at him. One lifeline still utilized, but Boop goes down, so it won't get used at all. Bravo Dog with a great cover being able to fire in with that Alda makes it very tough. Wolfie with another one takes down Avian. So inside of the garage, you've now made that player advantage back tilting your way. But Slaughterhouse still uh, have a lot to do here. 30 seconds to go and you've got to find a couple more really bunkered in defenders. JC looking in the bomb site now. Some shots coming from Zoinkers to scare him off, but it's not enough yet. Not Nova finds Blarn. That makes things a little bit better for you. Up on the top of Red Stairs, that's a big frag for Not Nova. A game turning one, and Zoinkers now alone in the one on four. Finds the first kill, but he's being watched. It's JC with the angle. Slaughterhouse gets the lead once again. I do. They've come pretty strong with these attacks. A couple of sketchy moments there. They almost lost it with Avian in that garage position. Could have been their undoing, but they managed to pull through. And now they're on a three round, three round wins for their first half, which is an attack half on Clubhouse. So that's pretty good. They're going to be feeling pretty happy with that going into their defense. And look, I've got to say, if Burden Biceps can't get this next round and they're down 4-2 at the half, it could be a really difficult position to come back from. Yeah, I think Slaughterhouse are a pretty complete team um, that in these last couple qualifiers have been looking just better and better every single week. Um... On the other hand, like, Bird and Biceps are a weird team. Like, you look at some of their games, and they play really, really well. You know, their big performers kind of pop off. They have some fantastic matches. And then you see some games where they just play the weirdest strats, and they fail totally, like, all over the place. 
Burden and Biceps, to me, haven't really had a lot of those in-between games. Perhaps this is one of the first where I'm seeing them just play all right. They're not out of their mind. They're not, like, tripping up as if they're golds. I don't know. They play relatively fine in this one. And I think, again, part of that is due to the fact that they want to probably hold a couple of these strats in their back pocket. They don't want to bring out everything up against Slaughterhouse in a match that really isn't going to have a huge impact on, um, you know, the rest of your careers. So, uh... You know, play things relatively safe here, um, and if you lose this one, I don't think Bird and Biceps are going to be all too concerned about it. Yeah, I have to agree, and uh, it's true, like, we're not seeing anything overly innovative or sweaty, if you want to call it that, coming out of the, the defense here with their strategies. And, uh, I mean, it's hard to hide what you do on attack, so I don't think there's anything strange coming out of Slaughterhouse either. Yeah. Um, but this seems just, yeah, like you said, wanting to just play it safe, finish out this round, and just start focusing on what's ahead. Well, what's ahead right now is uh, Jim Bedroom, and so, uh, although it's not the most important thing on their minds, I'm sure it's going to be what they're focused on for the next two and a half minutes. Bravo Dog taking some early damage, however, tries to return it. Not Nova takes quite a bit of damage, and he's now going to be playing a little bit more scared. Takes the long way around that crane, and now is going to uh, get nice and cozy to that building before he approaches the window again. Um, is Jacuzzi Wall already have a... An opening in it? That would be a very fast. No, it doesn't. I must have been seeing something. But they're in a good position to open it up now. JC looks like he'll be the one to do it, wanting to save those exothermic charges for uh, another day. Not a bad decision in my mind because, again, this is one where uh, it can be a little easier for the Maverick to do it. And you only have two of those exothermic charges, so you don't want to waste them on walls that uh, can be easily opened up by the Maverick. That's right, and to get this open nice and early is going to put that pressure on the defense. If Bravo Dog finally does with his aggressive picks, find a pick, and it's the Thatcher. Attackers so I think only one EMP used so far. That could really be a big issue for the attack. Double kill from Bravo Dog, thanks to that shotgun hitting the head of Not Nova at the end. Really well played by him, just on these central stairs, right? Able to come around and get that kill. Now your team's in a really good position to equalize, and I think you're quite happy about uh, the way that this has gone. Wolfsies is eventually going to be able to open that up, of course. Um, JC deciding they didn't want to hold on to that any longer. Up to the hatch, Blarn deals some damage out onto Boop. Boop is still fine, and he can throw down some of those lifelines perhaps to disrupt Blarn, but at the moment it seems like his skills are better used elsewhere. He's going to rotate off of that hatch and just go for a different angle. Yeah, and the defense just has so much control at the moment. This attack has really not had enough teeth to deposition them. Zoinkers has hardly moved from this master bed area, and he's just got really good angles that he can hold, as does Bravo Dog from below. So uh, this attack potentially just running to their doom at this stage. Only 45 seconds to go. Well, he's taking a little bit of damage. These Toxic Babes really coming in clutch. This is why you save them for the latter half of the round. They can really prove to help you out in these dying seconds when the attackers get so stalled out. Florence used all of them, but he's got a really good position just back behind this deployable shield. Missing a few shots there, unfortunately a little slow. Means the attackers are going to be able to get on in. And Wolfie can start opening up the second wall into the bathroom. That's an important one, however... Seems like maybe they were able to trick it. Blarn so close. He's going to be able to win the gunfight too with the SMG-11. It fires so quick and he wins it because of it. Boop now here trying to get that revenge kill. Can he do it? No, Blarn. Oh. SMG-11 is too good and downstairs a whole heck of a lot happens. But in the end, Bravo Dog comes out on top of it. And Burden Biceps equalize again to make it 3-3. Yeah, Bravo Dog really going big there. I think he ended at triple on that round. And the defense just had control that whole whole round really the attack didn't get anything going uh they, they tried really hard with that wall but the double pick from bravo dog nice and early just kind of ruined that attack for them so a 3-3 three, three half look it's pretty tight and we're gonna have to see what burden biceps can get going on their attack it's what you like to see right for the final match of the qualifier let's get some good games in here let's uh let's go all 15 rounds if we can let's have some fun with this game because uh you know, we've been casting for like five weeks on this channel, and uh, there's been some good games, there's been some bad games. It'd be fun to be able to end it with a, uh, a match that might not have a much in might not have much on the line in terms of consequences, but has a lot of uh, value just Protect in terms of the uh, enjoyment we all get from watching it. Yeah, absolutely. And you said it, you know what's enjoying? Uh, to watch Goyo strats. <laughs> I really uh, <laughs> love seeing them, man, and I really want to see what Slaughterhouse do with this Goyo. Um, I... I am just so intrigued about like the effectiveness of Goyo and how teams are utilizing him because I was one of those people that when he first came out, I thought, you know what, he could be really strong. Like three shields that all have the chance to deny the pace of the attack. Plus his loadout is quite strong as well. 
um, a lot of people cried that he might have been OP. So just seeing the fact that it doesn't seem like he's dominated per se, um, yeah, I, I find that really intriguing. I think he's in a relatively good uh, space, right? I mean, there's definitely a lot for the attackers to use their utility on right now, and I think that you could argue that maybe that's a, a growing problem inside of Rainbow, but at the moment, he doesn't seem to be destroying uh, win rate for attackers. He seems to be, you know, counterable, and a lot of teams typically uh, don't seem to struggle too too hard with him, but he's also still being brought, so uh, I don't know. Relatively good spot right now. I wouldn't like to see any uh, immediate rash changes, at least nothing drastic. So, we'll see. Uh, there is obviously both a Vigil and a Mozzie on the board. Boop is all the way on that top floor. This has been a pretty heavy roam strat to, to come out. Not quite the same from what we saw from Burden Biceps, right? They played it a little bit more standard. This time, you're kind of, uh, I mean, you're dipping your foot into both pools, right? Like, you've got a little bit of that uh, anchor operators in terms of the Goyo, your standard stuff like a Jaeger, but you've also got all this drone denial, and not Nova's actually going to catch one up top, meaning that uh, if it didn't get destroyed, then he's got an opportunity to catch some of these attackers off guard. Yeah, they're really going for the full room hunt here as well, which is something that we didn't see Slaughterhouse ever attempt. And this could be the big well, difference between these two teams. Dagger. If this room clear is not successful or takes a very long time, then it's going to make it a lot more comfortable for the defense. They open up now the, uh, the hatch on into Moto so they can have one uh, angle to drop on through. They've also brought the Maverick, so, you know, they aren't too worried about which hatches they want to open up, which hatches... Uh, they want to hold on to. Um, they can get most of these hatches without too much worry as long as uh, Crime Magic is efficient with his blowtorch. JC is still aggressive and Boop and not Nova. I mean, look at them all. They're still willing to go for these flanks. And if Burden Biceps aren't ready for it, this could be really, really bad for them. It's definitely not a rush into the bomb site. And so the fact that they aren't necessarily aware of all the roamers means that they could be in a lot of trouble in the last 30 or 45 seconds. Yeah, kind of looked like maybe they did have a drone on that Vigil though, because as he went to rotate mm. out that stock doorway to Kitchen, he was pre-fired. So that means the flank is potentially being watched, and the fact they're trying to try and get this wall open now is going to put a lot of pressure on these players in church. That shield in a great spot though, and deny a lot of coverage there for Plant if they were to retreat out. Yeah, I like how late it was placed too. Wolfie just adapting where this push is coming from. Finally, one of those roamers taken down. Boop found by Cry Magic. So really, only two players on the bomb site. Wolfie's coming back down. So uh, him and Swaggy here. You could perhaps get this. JC's inside as well now. So you're gonna have a little bit more trouble if you want to just rush on in. You probably gotta deal with everybody before you can actually go for this execute. 30 seconds. They've got a couple of different angles open. Of course, they've got the angle inside of Church. They've blown open that Goyo. So as soon as that fades, they can go for a plant there. Blarn's able to hit the shot on Nova. So there goes the Mozzie down that hallway. You saw a couple of different bodies. We'll see hits one on a Cry Magic. Two on four now as Avian also picks up one. So Inka's trying to find his teammate, but this might not be the right moment as his teammate's also planting. You gotta be careful that Avian doesn't die during this. JC's all alone though, and perhaps it doesn't matter. He's got the coverage that he needs to from that box. Not even scoped in. Burden Biceps will take that round. Good night, says Blarn. JC goes bye-bye. <laughs> yeah, almost, almost a chance there for the defense to hold that down. But at the end of the day, the attack is too strong. And uh, I like the decision that they picked up their... A teammate in the main stairs because it just meant they had the extra numbers there for post plant so good decision making from bird and biceps and now they've taken the advantage i believe for the first time in this mm -hmm. match yeah finally found the lead in round number seven perhaps swapping to uh, the attack was all it was going to take i mean i don't want to you know downplay bird and biceps throughout this match they started off with a couple of lost rounds but i think they've been playing uh, relatively strong and certainly keeping up with slaughterhouse throughout this so They've been fine. Church Arsenal will be the play again. So both these teams uh, deciding to bang their head against the wall for the first couple of defensive rounds and uh, both choosing to do so with a bit of a roam here on Church Arsenal. I'm wondering, in round number two, we did see Burden Biceps really rein in that roam game. I wonder if Slaughterhouse are going to do the same. And based on the fact that they have made no uh, operator swaps, it makes it feel like they probably won't. Yeah, probably not, and uh, I think it really just comes down to how it was played out. Uh, they probably needed a bit more impact on that room. I like what they tried to do, where they were just shooting some drones, maybe taking some early engagements, but not going too deep and then just pulling away. But at the end of the day, I think Burden Biceps read into that. They also decided not to overextend and just opened what they needed, and they've got too much forward control. So I think if they are going to dedicate to a room here, it just needs to be maybe a little bit more impactful. 
certainly I think there's uh, an argument to be made that you don't even really want to be droning for too or roaming for too long as long as you've got that intel denial you know you can kind of just poke your head up there for the first like minute of the round and then head back down to site um, certainly would have been useful to have some more bodies when the push actually came in from uh, burden biceps so yeah more impacts I mean coming back in you just don't want to waste your whole round and waste your life uh, doing nothing because that's obviously not going to help you out too much and based on their positioning other than not Nova two players we did see on that first floor and they can of course rotate up and down but it does make me a little bit hopeful that they will maybe come back to site a little bit sooner um, not Nova the exception all the way up in gym but he's still got hatches opened up for him so he can make uh, some some drops that he absolutely needs to yeah I'm just wasting some time again so far and this Room is being joined out to clear out the Zofia on the nice rotate watch there for billiards. Vigil definitely been spotted out by that drone. I'm pretty sure they're going to know that he's around main stairs, so they can shut that down. This is the really critical stage of this round because, as I was saying, this room does have to have some kind of impact, otherwise, it's not much of a point doing it because the flank watch seems too strong from Burden Biceps. And if they're able to just keep getting progress and keep opening things up, I'm not too sure Slaughterhouse are going to have much to do about it. Boot making the rotation to join his friend Nova up on that second floor. So um, a little bit more presence on that room. And you can tell that like B and B are taking their time. Um, they know that these players are up there, and so they're playing a little bit slower. They haven't really focused too hard on that bomb site. Prime Magic finds uh, the Vigil JC here on the main stairs, but JC playing it pretty passively as well, so probably not gonna die here. Uh, tempting is luck, but now he's all the way back to the bomb site, so he's wasted enough time he decides and he can just go back and chill. Prime Magic, of course, can't really be sure when that's going to be safe, and so uh, they're still going to have to waste a lot of time looking on their backs and, you know, being ready for these flanks. Yeah, the mozzie is still up in logistics, so there are, is flank potential there, and it's all going to come down to the flank watch of Burden Biceps. If they are all over that, the mozzie will essentially rotate to his death, and that could be happening very soon as he's making his way back through Master. Final 45 seconds now, though, and that means that especially these two roamers, they're going to have to get something happening. If this flank is mistimed or caught, then it just means these anchor operators on the defense are going to be under just too much pressure. 30 seconds. You've got everybody alive on both sides. Again, these roamers are pretty far up, so they're going to need to drop down and make something happen quickly. There goes the diffuser down, though, with Avian falling. A couple of kills going both ways. With uh, Swaggy with two. Here's like, another engagement inside of the bar. A run out coming from JC. That doesn't really amount to much. Bravo Dog, in the meantime, is planting. His teammates are all falling around him, though. He needs to take a gunfight with 12 seconds. He hits a great shot onto Boop. Now it's going to be all on these roamers to come on back. Swaggy's been sitting tight in this bomb site the whole round. Bravo Dog can start this plant. Now Barn makes his move, but he just dies. JC with that one. He can now come back in, but it's teammate Swaggy who does it. Slaughterhouse take round number eight back for them, and we continue to go back and forth with these rounds. Oh, I was a bit worried for the, uh, the vigil there. I guess the good intel came out with uh, the fact that Kitchen Hatch wasn't opened. Initially, he might have been able to use some vertical holes to deny, but deciding maybe that wasn't the play. And it worked out for the defense that Rome just ended up having enough frags on the way back where it meant that those anchor operators weren't under too much pressure. So it's 4-4 here, Jesse. Again, it's pretty tight. They're starting to trade rounds in this half, and we might be looking at a, a really close finish on this map. Just looking at the bomb sites, I mean, we haven't really flexed off of Church uh, in the second half. So uh, for me, it's really going to be whether like Slaughterhouse are super comfortable getting off of this site and going to... Uh, you know, the top floor and how they actually perform up there. Defenders the fact that they have a 60% win rate on this uh, map, and in two rounds we haven't seen them be too willing to get diverse with their uh, site selection, kind of speaks to me like they might not be so comfortable, you know, playing the different bomb sites here. Um, not that they don't have any strats uh, for CCTV cache and for gym bedroom, but probably that they're just less confident in those. So uh, it could still work against Burden Biceps, but I would be feeling relatively good if I'm BNB just based on like the small subtleties that you've seen from the uh, mannerisms of Slaughterhouse, I guess. Just, you know, not being so willing to go there could be a good thing for you. Yeah, I think that's the real tale here is whether they are competent on these other bomb sites. Uh, as you said, though, they're pretty persistent with Church, and whether that's because maybe they felt they could win it, which they did, or whether they just lack the depth in these other sites to see if uh, BNB are pretty efficient again with this Maverick Torch and they get that CCTV wall open really early. I think that's going to be uh, something that Slaughterhouse will be hard-pressed to deal with. 
I like Boop uh, going all the way down to that bottom floor inside of the basement. If he can go for another late flank, that could help them out. Um, it's been a bit of a double-edged sword for them because uh, when they've been defending on that bottom site, when those roamers tick too long, it's really hurt them. But if you can time it right, then they have been uh, relatively successful as in that last round. So I, I kind of like it. He's in a good position to come back if he needs to as well up those red stairs. So there's some opportunities for him. Um, they start to Maverick now into the CCTV wall. Again, these Goyo shields being utilized by the defense. Slaughterhouse really just feeling like uh, they can make a lot of stuff work. Wolfie with that Aldo almost found a kill. It's going to be his teammate who goes down first, though. Zoinkris hits him with a good knight. We've got a lot of people going to bed inside of this game, I suppose. Um, the Kaido off of the board is kind of an, uh, an important pick for uh, holding on to construction. Yeah, it is. Uh, if those electric claws were not thrown out or potentially held in the pocket for a trick there, then... That means they are forever lost, and it looks like that construction wall is not electrocuted, so that can be opened with relative ease. Maybe the impact trick is what they will have to worry about. Either way, it's a 5 versus 4 advantage now for these attackers. They're still at half the round to go, so a lot of time at their disposal. Teams are really getting into it in this matchup. You'll love to see it. A little bit of talk between these two squads as uh, this is the last match of the qualifiers, and uh, well, both these teams clearly taking it serious, which is nice. Prime Magic uh, getting some drone for him. He doesn't have anybody flanking him immediately, so he can focus on getting on into construction. Again, it's been a little bit slow for my liking. B&B &B probably wanted to be inside of construction a little while ago, but it's not the end of the world if they're just getting into it now. There's not a, a really strong hold from Slaughterhouse in here, so it shouldn't be too big. This should be relatively free for them to take, and they can start uh, pushing him from two different angles, which is nice. We've got a really great drone there in cash as well, just getting a lot of intel around that bomb area so that BNB will know what they need to clear out. That's another defender that drops there. Was the Maestro as well, really strong anchor operator. So this defense really falling apart. Diffuser is down in front of that wall, but there's a lot of players around there. They know exactly where this Yagi is, so if they can explode onto site, they can take that control. 30 seconds, and the attackers have a two-man advantage. You just need to root out these last few players, and this shouldn't be too tall of a task. Should be favoring them. Zoinkers destroys some uh, barbed wire, and he's got a grenade prepped. He's going for that evil eye, and he will successfully be able to hit it. There goes one of those toxic babes. will slow him down a little bit. He even gets a knife kill somehow on the boop. That's going to make this player advantage even worse. One more defender down, and Swaggy's alone with no HP. It's going to be a flawless one, thanks to Bravo Dog getting a slick 2k. Pushing into that uh, CCTV wall. Well done by them. They regain the lead one more time. Yeah, and uh, that looked really strong for them. Um, never really looked in doubt. They got their picks. They made all the progress they needed in good time. So time management was on point. And at the end of the day, the defense just had no answers for it. Uh, they are going to retry it, which I'm quite concerned about because hmm. uh, they just never really seemed at all in that round. I guess it's their call, right? Um, maybe not Nova survives a little bit longer. You could uh, feel a little bit uh, better about uh, how that round went for you. Was it even him playing on the uh, Kaid? I think it was, I don't know, it was somebody on that squad. But uh, you'd like to keep people alive for a little bit longer. The Kaid's gone anyways, and not Nova goes to the Mozzie. So probably not going to be like employing a super heavy um, roam. They had boop on it last time. I wouldn't expect that they put two on it. Perhaps wanting to extend this hole to construction a little bit wouldn't be a bad play. Um, can just like slow that angle down a little bit more. They'd already slowed it down a fair amount as Bird in the biceps took a bit of time to get on in there. But, you know, once they started really focusing it, it didn't seem like BNB were struggling too much. So maybe that's the play. There's already reinforcements going down uh, over by Jacuzzi Wall and the bathroom wall. So it does seem like they want to at least extend their hold a little bit westward. Yeah, and they're really going to have to do something impactful offside here because they haven't brought any wall denial. There's no mute jammers, there's no bandit charges, no kite charges. So CC wall, that can be opened 15 seconds, 20 seconds in, super quick if uh, Burn Biceps drone that out properly. And that means that there's going to be a lot of pressure on site and likewise construction. If they give up that control too early, again, construction wall should be able to get opened nice and early. Maybe an impact trick will come out. But either way, these steps will really apply uh, insurmountable amounts of pressure on the defense. Uh, they're really going to have to get some frags nice and early. Looks like Blarn is still perhaps going to throw one of those EMPs. He's ready for it. I think he's going to toss it. Avian finds that nothing's there, so perhaps he can tell his teammate, don't waste your utility. He tossed one just for good measure, I guess. They can open up that wall now totally for free. Avian will get that. Just one use of an extra thermal charge, and they have a great opening to look into this bomb site with no Kaid on the board. That's a very uh, nice little bit of you know wall destruction that you can uh, utilize. 
Now you're still gonna be focused on Garage a little bit here, it seems. They've got two frag grenades to try to root out Wolfie, who's holding up here with a couple of ADSs. Hopefully they can waste some of those as well. Here come the flashes to burn the ADS. Now the uh, can be all up to uh, Zoinkers, who can just really walk on in, and if they're all burnt, should be able to get a free kill on the Wolfie. Oh, just misses it though, unfortunately. They got a couple pings still, they can use their gun. But Wolfie surviving with like 80 health, that's huge for him. Peaks a little bit too long though, and Cry Magic gets the kill. Cry Magic oh, with double, wow. Geez. That's a good night. He just doesn't have the time to type it. I'll do it for him. Swaggy goes down. <laughs> There's no more smoke on the board. There's no more Maestro. Two huge picks to perhaps push B and B to match point. Yeah, it's really starting to fall apart here for Slaughterhouse. This attack just being too strong. And I think a real error in Operator Select here is what's really allowed this attack to just go forward so strongly. Zonkis finds another on the boot. It means it's all up to Not Nova. And the, uh, the Goyo, 2 versus 4, is Not Nova does get to see 4 kill, but this might be a little too late as this attack is still very much in control. Sitting inside of cash right now is Nova, JC just to his left, so they're uh, holding strong, but this garage push is going to be where a lot of the trouble comes from. There's so many angles the attackers have into CCTV, it means that you really can't be comfortable no matter where you're sitting. Um, not Nova's found a neat little spot where he only has to watch one angle, which is good for him for a while, but somebody again could push around and catch him off guard. Avian runs in and is going to start this plant. There's not a lot of utility to stop him. No Nitro cell for Not Nova. There is one from JC, however, but just doesn't land. Avian can continue planting. Zoink is the double on Not Nova and JC alone in a one-on-four. Prime Magic's been down. But he's getting picked back up inside a garage, so uh, this is still looking very, very difficult. Cry Magic holding inside of there, and Blarin still down below. Uh, JC vaults on out. He can't get any frags from out there. This time we're really against him. He goes all the way, drops through the hatch. Is he trying to kill Blarin? Yeah, he is. Well, it doesn't work. Burden Biceps take round 10 and push themselves to match point. Yeah, that's, uh, it was just too <laughs> strong of an attack, really. They just found those picks. Blarin questioning. The Goyos play there, and that means that Burn Biceps will be on match point now. They are one round away from securing this map, and that will be all set and done for these Challenge League qualifiers. Uh, it just means that Slaughterhouse is going to be perfect for two rounds to get it to OT. He's going to Villa, apparently. You know what? <laughs> when we're here in the, you know, what is this? The 45th match of the qualifiers, and, uh, <laughs> and both these teams are already locked in for uh, closed quals, then hey... Uh, maybe we'll just make it all the way to Villa if they can run fast enough. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be, where, where are we right now? I guess Germany to, to Italy? That's not too far. I mean, you could make it a lot worse, right? Yeah, just like a short train ride or a really quick plane ride. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's doable. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, so look, I think Slaughterhouse, even their church defense, they took two attempts to get it right, and... Uh, even then, the, the attacks will look pretty good. I say this is fairly going to be in favor of Bird and Biceps at this stage. And they're trying to play, you know, a little bit of mind games in this chat, you could say. They're trying to really <laughs> push Slaughterhouse off their game. Hey, man, that's, uh, that's the banter you get in Tier 2 North America. It's, uh, it can get spicy, <laughs> but uh, that's just the way it goes when sometimes these matches get pretty intense. You like to see players get into it a little bit, as long as you're not going uh, overboard. <laughs> I think it'd be fun to see a little bit of this uh, banter going back and forth because, yeah, both these teams obviously uh, feeling pretty good about just making it to where they're at. They'd like to be able to end these qualifiers off on a win. If not, they're not going to, you know, go home and uh, sob about it. But uh, I do hope that with what this is setting up, we at least get to see these teams uh, face off in the closed qualifiers because that would be a spicy game. <laughs> yeah, it really would. And uh, they're getting some pretty good insight here as well for it. As, uh, look, Avian's already opening up the CC wall. They are going to push into this roam maybe this time, as Boop does start to push away. Not looking to engage. Some free fire coming out, not hitting any marks. And again, it's all going to come down to this roam clear. If they get a pick, which they do, actually, it's the first time this roam being really successful with the frags. That's Boop opening it up. Could Boop. mean a difference here. Oh, yeah, looking to silence his opponents as he now is going to tilt the favor uh, the way of... Um Slaughterhouse, there we go. It'll be interesting to see if he wants to get even more aggressive because, again, the, the adrenaline is kind of pumping. Doesn't seem like it. He goes all the way back down to the bottom of blue. However, holding the angle, not willing to give it up. Trying to find Cry Magic, but Cry Magic playing just a little bit too safe. He now decides that, you know what, it's probably not good if I die here. Let me go uh, open up some hatches and then I'll re engage with this because. Uh, Boop's been hitting some shots all night long, and uh, if you really want to tempt him, you'll probably be able to get a couple more before this game ends. 
Yeah, and Pulse is there to get some good intel for his team as well. There are three around the blue hatch area in stock. In fact, four players at the, at the moment, but they are going to move away. Not Nova has pushed up the main stairs here. That might not be noticed, and he may be able to get a pick if they're not too careful. Look at this long angle from Wolfsy. He's up all those hatches. He's got a, a really long scope or a really long uh, angle to hold. He can maybe find somebody way up there. I do like this quite a bit. Boop now taking a bunch of damage and trapped inside of Oil Pit. This is a poor position to find yourself in. He couldn't have an escape though, and he does. Can he get out? Yes, he can. On just no a sliver way. of HP. Blarn drops now, but eventually finishes off what he started thanks to a headshot and a boop. Not Nova's right there though, so this player advantage uh, not sticking for the defense is, uh, well, good counter to be able to come out as they drop an Oil Pit. Yeah, and that was not Nova in that aggressive position on the main stairs. Finding that pick, they really didn't know that a player had pushed up. So maybe some drones not left in good places. This pulse will finally start to get some good intel. Avian finds one onto Not Nova, so he didn't quite make it back to site safely there. Nicely cut off. It means it is a three versus three, but only 30 seconds to go, and they're only starting to really put that pressure on site here. Yeah, for the game, they're going to need to start speeding this up. Avian could uh, maybe open up that catch and hatch if he's got the utility, but again, time really going to be working against them. This is for uh, all the bragging rights in the world right now. A couple of frag grenades still in the pockets of Zoinker, so perhaps he could maybe drop one on the attackers, but he's got to rotate down instead. Slaughterhouse has been pretty safe just sitting down here. However, not for long, Blarn drops, and he gets a kill right before it. JC falls another for Blarn. That's three on the round. Can he find Swaggy, though? That's the question. They can start this plant. So Swaggy has the initiative, but he just flicks over, and Zoinker oh, hits that. Flick. What? Good night. Burden biceps take the match. And with it, they're going <laughs> to really increase their ego. Oh, a fun oh, game. Fun game from BNB and Slaughterhouse. <laughs> Look, that was a great flick from Zoinkers. Uh, you got to give him that. And a, a good execute in the end. It was a three versus three. All the favor on the defense, really, because they didn't have a whole lot of control. Uh, but Blonde getting that 2k dropping through blue. Fantastic effort. And they closed that map out pretty strongly in the end, considering it was a 3-3 three, three half. Yeah, to be fair, I mean, uh, it really got kind of one-sided at the end, but uh, perhaps that's just a side swap, or perhaps that's fatigue. I mean, you take a look at uh, what these players have been through, and uh, I think it'd be, it'd be valid to maybe not be playing uh, your peak performance in that uh, second half of that game. But you know what? That's the qualifiers, folks. All of North American Open qualifiers, 45 games, um, a ton of matches, five weeks, uh, doing math, I don't know, a bunch of play days. Um, and, uh, and a fantastic <laughs> time. Raven, I'd like to thank you so much for uh, closing these qualifiers out with me. It was a real blast casting to you these couple of times that we managed to uh, fit you in the schedule. And I uh, hope we get to cast again one day. Yeah, for sure. I really appreciate you inviting me. And it was just great to see some NA matches, not just the Pro League games that we get to see on broadcast, but I think especially the NA CL stuff doesn't really get a whole lot of exposure from where mm. I am. Um, so being able to see that firsthand and cast, it's been really exciting. Um, I'd definitely love to do it again. And thank you, Keg, one of our three uh, constant observers. We had uh, working a ton during these qualifiers. Um, observers don't get enough love, so please uh, sh spread some love for Keg in the chat, as well as Ty, who's been in here and uh, observed a lot of games for us over these last five weeks. So that is it. The close, the close qualifiers will return sometime after uh, the Invitational. It's actually posted. People don't know uh, when these qualifiers are, but they are public. It's on ESL right now. I don't know the exact dates, but uh, you can go check it out. If you're not aware already, those qualif close qualifiers are up. They're going to be after the Invitational ends. For now, uh, you know, take Thursday off. EU quals are continuing on Thursday because they had some issues. Um, so go watch those if you'd like. Otherwise, go enjoy the Invitational. Come back for close qualifiers. That'll likely be on this channel as well. Until then, I hope you all have a wonderful night, a wonderful Invitational, and I'll see you sometime in the future. Have a good night. Bye-bye.